Good morning, welcome to Albion Island Baptist Church. We're so glad that you're joining us today in the worship song. We're getting a late start this morning. Uh, I'm Willie Williams, I direct music here. We're going to ask you to stand with us as we uh, start off in worship this morning, singing, Are You Washed in the Blood of the Lamb? <laughs> Would you please? 
Baptist Convention, they adopted the, the Baptist statement uh, in faith. So, um, Baptist faith and message. And so, we're going to use the Baptist faith and message as a structure, and then we're going to understand the scriptures that go behind that. So, this morning, we're looking at Article 1, the scriptures, and we looked at 1 Timothy 3 16 and 17, and 2 Peter 1 19 through 21. And we understood what the Bible says about itself. So that's an example. Um, it's going to go through next May. We're going to cover all 18 articles so that each one of the youth have an opportunity to come to this class and get essentially a comprehensive systematic theology uh, to learn the doctrines of the scriptures. I encourage you, you to encourage your parents to bring you to this class. Thank you, Ike. Right behind him, his daughter Jenna has an announcement. I attended a water for a couple of years this year and last year. And it was really great. I memorized a lot of verses, but we are really, really short on workers. And we just need some people to step up for that. So, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, it appears that probably the Lord has provided a commander for Awana, and uh, we're waiting for an official. Uh, Yes, on that, but she, she will need workers. We have to have workers to, just like vacation Bible we saw all the volunteer workers to make that work. A lot of won't work without volunteers. So we need people who will be uh, little club leaders or just people who come and listen to the children recite their Bible verses. So we want you to sign up that. We would really like to start two weeks from today, uh, Sunday night, September 7th. It would be a great time to start a lot of but we need some workers. We need to contact the office and tell us you're willing to help. And we'll get this thing up and running. We're going to uh, provide some uh, training at nighttime on Sunday evenings while you parents bring your children to Wanda. We have something for you, too. And I have some great video Bible study programs I want to share with you people. And this is a great chance to do that. So we'll have a Sunday night Bible study for the adults who come. And we just ask you uh, prepare to consider being part of you know, on the team, there, there are two things in our church I never want to see fall to the ground. One is the Faith Bible Institute meets on Monday night, and the other is Awana. So those are the two programs we have to do strictly with teaching people what the Word of God says. And that's the most important thing we can do for people is teach them that. So we'd like you to uh, sign up and help out with uh, the Awana Club. If, if we we'll get enough work, we we'll start two weeks from tonight, uh, on September 7th. At probably 5 30 or 6 o'clock in the afternoon. The, the, the staff has to come together and make those determinations. We don't wait them and impose them on the workers. We let you get together and make up your mind when you want to do this. So we need to decide what to help us make the place. Okay, right now, would you please be so kind as to stand up and greet each other in Jesus' name and uh, just welcome each other from church. Well, <laughs>
uh, in need or, or no needy people, please get the word out for us. Uh, we are working to get more uh, people uh, uh, coming to the church and, and, and get some food. But right now, we only have a small amount of people that are actually using the, uh, our uh, food, I guess. And uh, like I said, uh, what we need is to get the word out a little bit. And so we're working on a plan to get more people to, to know that we have food for them. But uh, uh, <laughs> wasn't ready for this. I'm sorry. <laughs> Another thing we're working on. As soon as we uh, uh, start getting people to know, uh, we, we they usually they call us. Naomi's here usually about three to four times a week, and she's here throughout the day. So if they call us, we'll, I mean we'll probably be open, but we are gonna set a date to where it's always gonna be maybe Tuesdays and Wednesdays, Thursdays. You know where it'll always be open, but that we don't know yet. But uh, but like I said, she's here yeah, already. Yeah, more like an appointment type of thing. You know, yeah. they want to come, they can just give me a call and I can meet up there and help. And this is not just church members. This is all the local communities, all the local immigrants. If you have an uh, airman that uh, you know got married young and had kids and really could use uh, you know some, some food or clothes and whatnot, there's tons of baby clothes, tons of baby food, we have everything. So please, like I said, everybody is uh, welcome. We just uh, need to get more people coming in and maybe saying, wow, so what is this about? Well, this is about Jesus helping you all. Thank you very much. God bless you. We were down in the food room last night looking at some stuff. And we appreciate your gracious, generous hearts. We know you're doing things well. But, you know, hamburger helper and taco kits might not mean anything to someone from Ghana or Nigeria or Romania. There's some stuff we Americans take for granted other people in the world don't know what to do with. I don't know what people from Africa would do with hamburger helper. I, they've probably never seen it. So uh, as, as good as you're doing, we appreciate it, but kind of keep it in the you know, beans and rice and uh, things that, that anybody can cook, pasta, canned vegetables, that kind of thing. Let's kind of keep the, uh, I don't know what you call it, peripheral stuff away because most people outside of the United States don't know what to do with those things. So thank you so much for helping us out. God bless. Let's see. Well, VBS too. That was amazing. Oh, VBS gave two yeah. huge boxes of canvas. They had over my good items. Over 200 articles given during the VBS. You guys should continue to worship with us this morning. Uh, you can stand, you can sit, you can pray. Uh, you don't have to join us in singing if you don't want to. Uh, we just want you to make a joyful noise this morning. And uh, we're going to see the heart of worship. Thank mm -hmm. you.
These twelve Jesus sent out and commanded them, saying, Do not go into the way of the Gentiles, do not enter a city of the Samaritans, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And as you go, preach, saying, The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out demons. Freely you have received, freely give. Father, as we open your holy word, before the Lord, we open our hearts before you. Ask you to fill those voids in our lives, teach us, instruct us, motivate us, inspire us, correct us. Lord, you know what we need. And we just count on you, our loving Heavenly Father, to deliver what we came here seeking this morning. Lord, let everyone leave this building at the end of the service. And it was good to have been in the house of, the, of God today because he spoke to me in an unmistakable way. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. <coughs> we have a marvelous picture of Jesus in this passage. Him at work. Him talking about work. Him concerned about who's going to do the work. It's a marvelous passage, a marvelous picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I want us to begin by looking at verses 35 and 36, asking ourselves simply, what does Jesus do? What does Jesus do? Now, if we look at this, we see here in, in the first half of verse 35, Jesus went about all the villages, teaching the synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom. He cures people. He cures needs. In this part of that verse, we see him dealing with the spiritual ailments of people. People have spiritual sickness. I know you probably know some people who have really serious physical ailments, and their heart goes out for them, you have compassion for them, you probably pray for them, you wish they could be healed, and there are some really dreadful physical conditions. I will admit that. But spiritual sickness is the worst kind of sickness that there is. It's by far worse than any physical ailment. So Jesus goes about trying to cure the spiritual ailments of these people. He goes among them teaching and preaching. Preaching what? The gospel of the kingdom. Why? Because it's in the kingdom that the spiritual ailments are healed. It's where the cure for all the spiritual diseases comes from. It's in the kingdom of God. And we get into the kingdom of God through the Lord Jesus Christ. He cures those spiritual ills. But then in the second half of verse 35, healing every sickness and every disease among the people. He also heals the physical ailments. He is the great physician. You never knew anyone who was sick or injured and got well without God having been on the job. Amen. He is the great physician. I know we have great doctors. We have a lot of them here in this church. We love that. We, the medical science has come so far in the last 40 years. It's amazing the things they can do now. And that's wonderful. We love it. We thank God for it. But behind every seemingly miraculous cure, every surgical cure, every medicational cure, every therapeutical cure, <coughs> the great physician is at work. He always is the one who does the healing. So those are the things that Jesus does. He cures spiritual diseases. He cures physical ailments. But there's something else in this passage that Jesus does. And it's seen in verse 36. When he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion for them. Because they were weary and scattered like sheep having no shepherd. Jesus cures because Jesus cares. <coughs> Jesus cares. What shape would the world be in today? What condition would your life be in today if Jesus did not have compassion? If he had no care for you and for your physical ailments and your spiritual ailments? He has compassion. Now the word compassion, that C-O-M in the beginning means it have something along with someone else. And look at the passion, the, the suffering, the, the whatever it is. Jesus shares with these people. You look at that, they're scattered, they're weary, they're tired, they're beat down, they're run down, they're about to give up. His heart moves with, toward them. This, this, word, this whole clause, he was moved with compassion, translates just one Greek word, uh, the root of which uh, was derived from the Greek word that gives us the English word spleen. Now, I don't know if you've ever heard anybody so agitated at their spleen and giving them trouble. Well, what this, what this is saying is that when Jesus looked at this throng of people, weary and scattered, run down, beat down, defeated, about to give up, it touched him way down in the very depths of his inner being so that he felt it internally in his organs. He felt compassion for these people. He cared. You and I cannot ever quite imagine the depth to which Jesus cares about people who are struggling in this world today especially those afflicted with spiritual diseases. We just don't know. The word they were weary, the King James, the original 
original King James says painted. It's a Greek word used in other uh, ancient manuscripts to, in the sense of plunder, concern, vexation. When I say they were beaten down, that's kind of what I'm talking about. The word they were scattered comes from an original word. It means they were prostrate on the ground, just beaten down, completely helpless. They'd given up. The Roman Empire, with all of its taxes and the authority it exerted on the, the rabbis and the synagogues and all the pressure that put on them to live according to the uh, laws of Moses, all this thing, and, and just the, the many other commands they gave them about how to fulfill the 613 original commands, they were just beaten down, seeing no hope. And Jesus was moved with compassion. It touched him way down in the inner part of his guts, the condition these people were in, and he cared. Now, there's an interesting thing happening in this passage. He refers to them here as sheep. Don't be alarmed if Jesus looks at you and calls you sheep, okay? It's not a, a thing to be concerned about. It happens often throughout the Bible. Uh, in John 10, for example, in just the first 15 verses of John chapter 10, we refer to a sheep 10 times in 15 verses. Uh, there's a place in Matthew 10 where uh, he tells his disciples, go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Uh, that's repeated in, in uh, chapter 15, verse 24. Uh, there's an interesting verse back in Psalm 95, verse 7. I struggled with this thing the first time I read it. And it says, <laughs> listen very carefully, for he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. Doesn't that sound a little bit reversed? Should we be the sheep of the pasture and the people of his hand? I thought about that. I had to dig deep to find out what that means. The shepherds in those days, when they brought their flocks out of the field of the night, brought them back to the sheepfold. As they passed through the door, they'd run their hands down their sides to see are there any wounds, any injuries, anything that needs to be dealt with. So they, they couldn't go back to the sheepfold without passing through the hands of the shepherd. I can't believe it. As a matter of fact, it's in the, the words of one of the songs we sing sometimes, that very verse of Scripture. I don't want to be a sheep of his hand. I want to be a people of his hand. Let the sheep go out in the pasture and all. Uh, that's, that's not what it's talking about. We are sheep, but he is a great shepherd. He's the good shepherd. And he cares about us. He cures us. He heals us. He takes great care of us because he cares so very, very deeply for us. Now, that's what Jesus does. He cures the spiritual ailments. He cures the physical ailments. He cares for people who are struggling in this world. His heart goes out to them. He feels it way down in his very inner being when people are struggling and beaten down, oppressed. And, and defeated. What does Jesus want? What does Jesus want? It's there in our passage in verse 37. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Why would he have said something like that if he did not want a harvest? <laughs> he wants a harvest. He wants someone to bring the crop in out of the field. Now this is an interesting thing. He just got through talking about us as sheep, and now all of a sudden we're plants or weeds or, or wheat or something. We, you know, the Bible, Jesus has so many different ways of referring to you and me. We're sheep, we're wheat, we're plants, we're fruit trees, we're a building sometimes. We're, we, each one of you out there, if you're saved, you're a living stone and you're being built up as a house uh, for God. It's an amazing thing how Jesus refers to us. But right here he switches his metaphor from sheep to wheat. The, the, the fields out there are white unto harvest. The harvest is plentiful. But the laborers are few. Those were the people that Jesus was looking up upon with compassion. He saw them out there. They seem to have no direction in life. They don't know what their purpose for being on this earth is. They don't know why they're here. They don't even know that they were, they were created in the image of God. They have no idea what God has in store for them. They're just wandering around lost like they have no one to guide them. And his heart went out to them. And he wanted someone to go out there and reap that harvest. The harvest is plentiful. You know, there are places in the world today where someone like me can go and stand and preach. And anywhere, depending on the size of the crowd I have, half the people in the crowd will step forward to get saved. People who are hungry for the gospel of Jesus Christ. I saw it in Belarus. I've seen it in Romania. When we stand and preach, and just dozens and dozens of people come. Hungry for the gospel. <coughs> the harvest just waiting to be plucked up and harvested. He said, well, that's not that way around. How do you know? How do you know it's not that way where you live or where you work? Have you ever made an effort to reap some of that harvest where you live and work and play and whatever? 
You'll never know unless you stick the sickle in and begin to try to, to, to harvest what's out there. Jesus said the harvest truly is plentiful, but the laborers are few. It's not that there are no people on the planet who want to get saved. It's that there are few, far too few people who will tell them that Jesus is ready to heal their spiritual diseases. He wants harvesters. He tells them. He gives them a command here. Therefore, pray the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. And it's based on this verse. I say pray and then watch. You see, when we study the Bible, it's an interesting thing to, to look at it sometimes. And you see passages like this. say, okay, now he was talking to those 12 guys there that day. Does that include me? We go back to the, to the end of Matthew to the Great Commission. Well, he was just talking to a little group of 11 guys there that day. Was that really applied to me? We go to Acts 1.8. Okay, he was just talking to those, uh, those apostles. Does that really? Yes. Those people stand in as our agents when Jesus is talking to them. And what he speaks to them, he is speaking to us. He wants us to pray that God will send laborers out into that plentiful harvest out there that the harvest can be brought in. Someone needs to go out there and get them. Someone needs to work in the harvest. And the Lord is saying, you Christian people, pray about that. And that's why I say pray and watch. Pray and watch. Because oftentimes, when you pray a prayer like this, after a while it will come to you. Sometimes it, when you least expect it, the thought will pop into your mind, why, I can do that. Why am I praying and the Lord sends somebody else out there? Then when I can do that. And very often you find yourself to be the answer to your own prayer. And it ha I believe it happened here. That's why I think in the first verse of chapter 10, those same people he told to pray, now he's sending them out. I think they realized that. Pray that the Lord of the harvest will send out laborers. Now if you're the laborers, go get them. <laughs> they became the answer to their own prayer. That will happen oftentimes in our life if we just give the Lord a chance. Now the next thing I want to say to you is not in the Bible. I can't give you a reference. I want to tell you it's an inference, not a reference. Uh, and I know what the, those two mean because of uh, your dictionary.com. So uh, <laughs> it's, they're not a reference, it's, it's an inference. You wouldn't want to be a farmer and send laborers out into your field to bring in a harvest unless you had a good place to put that harvest. Amen. You want somewhere to keep that harvest so it will be there preserved, first of all, made perhaps even to get better than it was when you brought it in, and it's there <laughs> to serve you when you need it. You want to put the harvest in a safe place. Jesus wants a harvest. He wants harvesters. He wants a home for his sheep, both the old ones and the new ones. You know, the Apostle Paul wrote about new Christians and those needing the sincere milk of the word. He talked about mature Christians needing to be feeding on the meat of the word. God wants a place where all his sheep can be gathered in and they can be fed whatever it is that they need at the level of their spiritual maturity at the moment that they come. He wants a place to bring them in. Uh, I got a Billy and I took that picture right outside in uh, southeastern Ohio when we were on sabbatical earlier. We just kind of liked it. It looked like a, probably a pretty good place to bring a crop or to bring your flocks, your herds, whatever. A good place to put your stuff up so you can keep it. And this is something that, that Jesus wants. Now, let me talk to you about this just a minute. The church is the place where Jesus wants the lost sheep to be brought when they're found. It's the place where he wants the ripened grain to be brought when it's harvested. The church is the house that Jesus has prepared for those that come in from out in the cold, those who were, for whom he had compassion and sent out laborers. And it's our challenge as people in this church to provide the kind of sheep coat, if you want to, the sheep fold, or the kind of silo or storage place where when his people come in, they will be nurtured here. They'll be allowed to grow, to improve, to get better, to always be available for his service when he comes looking for someone to do something. We need to be that kind of people. That means, church, we need to have people here in, in, in the congregation who are willing to take on some little jobs here and there. You say, you know, I, I asked Billy to sing that song on purpose. Some people say, well, I can't get involved. That. That's, that's too small for me. If God's in it, nothing is too small. It, it, it's all great work. And, and the, the kingdom of God requires the, the Billy Grahams and those mass evangelists who go out and get people saved by the thousands. It requires people in the local church to be there to take them by the hand, lead them in, sit them down, and show them how to behave in church and help them get things done. Amen. Our church is hurting right now because we've got lots of wonderful, intelligent, talented people out there who aren't really giving us any help. We've got so many committees that are vacant. We've got positions that need to be filled. We've got people. We, we need somebody to step up and help us make this a good, strong, safe, comfortable place for God's children to come to when they're harvested out of that field out there. 
We need help. He said, well, I'd like to help preacher, but I just don't, I don't think I have the ability. Stay in your seat. I got something for you. What Jesus wants, what Jesus does, what he wants, what he gives. Let's look at the first, first verse of chapter 10. And when he had called his twelve disciples to them, he gave them power over unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal all kinds of sickness and all kinds of disease. Now, at this point, he has sent them nowhere. He's getting ready to send them somewhere. But before he sends them, what does he do? He <coughs> equips them for what he's going to have them do. He gives ability. He gives ability. They don't know what the assignment is, yet it's coming. But before the assignment comes, he gives them ability. There are people sitting before me here this morning to whom God has given ability to do anything and everything this church needs. You go into 1 Corinthians chapter 12, you find that every part of the body has a function to fulfill. The, the heart and the brain you have those really major, major functions. Somehow or another, the, the nails on our little toes have an important function. I don't know what it is yet, but it has one or they wouldn't be there. Your appendix and your tonsils, even though they're disposable, they have a function. Every part of the body has a purpose. And the, 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 the Bible says that the Holy Spirit puts the members in the body as he sees fit. <laughs> and I like that. I mean, he, he sees it as being suitable, but I also like in English, he sees fit. He sees, you fit right in, right where he puts you. That's not what it means in the Bible, but that's a good implication for us. He puts people in the body because the body has needs. And he puts people here who, who can fill those needs. Already equipped. Would a loving Savior, would, would he send his, his apostles out to do a job as, as challenging as, as go out in that, that field where the harvest is plentiful if he didn't equip them first to go? Would he bring people into this church ready to do things unless he had given you first of all the ability to do it before he sent you in here? I think not. I think not. He's already given you that ability. Would, would Jesus have told Simon Peter... Uh, to, to come to him on the water, to not already equip him to walk on water. No, he would never have asked him to get out of that boat. <laughs> Unless he already knew Peter can walk on water, because I have given him that power. So anything that the Lord asks you to do, he has equipped you already to do it, and he just asks you, now bring what I've given you, and let me use it in this church. The assignment. Come with me down to verses 5 and 6. These 12 Jesus sent out. He equipped them first, and then he sent them. I love that. I think that's the way God works. These 12 Jesus sent out and commanded them, saying, Do not go into the way of the Gentiles. Do not enter a city of the Samaritans. But go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Now, a lot could be said about this. Was he being biased? Was he being prejudiced? None of those things. He's not a respecter of persons. He just had a specific target, a specific task for these apostles to do at this moment in time. His assignment is very specific. Don't go to the Gentiles. Don't go to the Samaritans. Go to the Israelites. Well, what we have here is a picture. God is a tremendous personnel manager. He's a tremendous boss. He's a tremendous strategist. So when he gives people assignments, he will be specific. Here's what I want you to do for me. Listen, when my call to preach started coming, there was never any doubt in my mind what it was. Now, I'll have to tell you down through the years that I've debated going to this church or that church, I've had some time when there were two or three options out in front of me, and I had to wait uh, and, and see, you know, Lord, what are you doing? Where am I supposed to go? I see three things out there calling at me. And eventually, as I waited patiently and kept praying, he would make it very specific where I was supposed to be the, the next phase of my life. He will be that way with you. He will not ask you just to jump in and do something. He will tell you what he wants you to do. Knowing he has already equipped you to do it, that you're fully capable of doing exactly what he asked you to do. Now, he gave the ability, he gave specific targets. He gave specific tactics in verse 7 and the first part of verse 8. As you go, preach, saying the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out demons. Here are the strategies, the tactics I want you to use as you carry out my big strategy of harvesting that plentiful harvest out there. Do these things. I love the specificity of his assignment here. 
here's where I want you to go, here's what I want you to do when you get there. And they did it. That is how God works. It's how he wants to work in the lives of some people here in our church today. He will not leave you doubting. He will not leave you questioning. He will be very specific about what he wants you to do and how he wants you to do it. Our challenge is to step up and say, Lord, here am I. Send me. That was Isaiah's response back in Isaiah chapter 6 when the Lord said, who will go for me? Here am I. Send me. Jesus needs some people here at Aviano Baptist Church say, Lord, here I am. Use me. Assign me. Give me work to do. Help me see how I can make this church be a place where we can bring in the sick and the injured, the physically sick and the, and, and the, the spiritually ill, uh, how we can bring in the needy people to meet their needs. Help me find where I can fit in that plan. And he will be very faithful to honor those requests. And you pray about those things and watch to see what he has coming for you. Well, here is something that Jesus said to some people back in John chapter 14, verse 12. Most assuredly I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also, and greater works than these will do, because I go to my Father. Have you ever considered for a moment that Jesus said, if we have enough faith in him to trust him completely, we will be able to do greater works than he did while he was here on earth walking around. That blows my mind, friends. I don't understand that for a moment. I cannot see it. Lord, I can't put a little saliva in some dust and make a little mud put it on a blind man's eyes and make them see. I can't do it. I can't speak to a dead person. They rise up and then Lazarus come forth. I, I can't do those things, Lord. But I, my name is Jesus, Sam, and then you just shut up and listen to me. I have told you, if you're trusting me, you will do greater works than that. I won't waste you doing those things, because those things are going to fade away one day. I have greater works than that for you to do. Why, Lord? Help me. I don't understand. Sam, there are works out there to do, the results of which will last for all of eternity. The blind man can see for a while, but someday his eyes are going to close in eternal blindness. The people I raised from the dead, they're going to walk around alive for a while. They're going to die again. But Sam, if you and your church go out into that plenteous harvest and you begin to bring them in and you prepare a place for them that's all fixed up and ready for them and they come in and they begin to grow, that's a result that's never, ever going to end. It's going to last forever and ever and ever. And that's greater than all these little temporary miracles I'm doing. That eternal miracle is greater yet. Amazing. You'll do greater works than I do if you have faith in me. Now notice the if. If. If you have faith in me. Why do so few Christians in the Western world ever get involved in, 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 in anything having to do with lost people? We just don't trust God. We, we look at ourselves, we see all of our limitations, all of our uh, hang-ups, all of our reluctances, all of our other distorted priorities. We say, I can't do Jesus says, if you have faith in me, you can do greater things than I've done. If you just go. When I call, you say yes, and then watch what happens. You pray, and then watch for the, for the results. It will happen, just as I've told you to do. Well, what Jesus does, what Jesus wants, what Jesus gives, he gives the ability, and he gives the assignment. He gives the tactics, and he gives the targets. And one last thing to say in the close our sermon. In the very last part of verse 8 of chapter 10, what Jesus expects. Freely you have received, freely give. Freely you have received, freely give. Is there anyone in the house this morning who say, I got my salvation by paying for it? I got my salvation because I earned it. No. There's not a born again Christian on the planet who can say those things. Everything we have from the Lord Jesus Christ came to us very, very free. Very abundant and very free. It was a gift from God. And he's telling us who have received so freely to give in the same way that we received. Give of our time, give of our talents, give of our resources, 
give, give, give because Jesus gave and he gave and he gave and he continues to give and he wants us to give as well. Pray ye therefore. The Lord of the harvest and for laborers is the harvest. Pray and watch. It's easy to slide through the first part of our life let these little opportunities slip by and say, no big deal, I'll catch up one day. Uh, young people have an attitude about those kinds of things. We've got forever, you know, we don't have to do anything now. We never consider all the opportunities passing us by. Then one day we'll get a little older, and that may be a little age bias. I put an old man up there. I can relate to that guy. I can. <laughs> I can. Come to a place in life when you look back over the years you've passed and you'll begin to see all the opportunities you let slide by. And when they were first approached you, they looked like little things. And if you look back, they were gigantic. Oh, if I had only back then done that, what would have happened? If I had just reached out and grasped that opportunity while it was there before me, what would have happened? Now it's too late. I look around, that opportunity's not here anymore. I missed it when it went by me. Don't let that happen to your life, folks. Don't let that happen. A Christian lady named Angela Thomas, I saw her on TV just this week. She wrote a book entitled Stronger. It's written primarily for women, but the principle of the book, the theme of the book, could apply to men as well. And she said that people need greater strength in their daily walks. She says that a woman or a man can get saved and then limp weakly into heaven. Her book was written to help people march strongly and confidently and victoriously into their, to their eternal reward, serving Jesus Christ every step of the way. And there's a little verse of scripture that sends chills all over my body every time I think of it. Now little children abide in him that when he shall appear you may have confidence and not be ashamed before him that is coming. I would hate to have to face Jesus someday looking at all the past opportunities, all the missed opportunities have nothing to show him in terms of service, have nothing to show him in terms of obedience. I just let all the opportunities slide by me, Lord. And now here I stand empty-handed before him is coming. Don't limp into heaven. Go charging full steam ahead. Lord, I've finished the course. I've fought a good fight. Here I am. That's the way you want to go. Pray about all the things our church needs people to do. Pray about all the things this community of Aviano needs Christian people to do. There are things we can't count on the sinners to do. You know, it has to be the Christians who do them. Pray about those things and then watch. The Lord will answer your prayer. Sometimes, not every time, but sometimes he'll show you, you the answer to your own prayer. If he does that, do not reject it. Embrace it with a great big shout of hallelujah because something good is about to happen in your life because you obey the voice of the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, your word is clear to me. I've tried to make it clear to others. I'm aware that sometimes there are things only your Holy Spirit can do. So in these closing moments, Father, I pray that you set me aside and you whisper to people sitting there based on what we have here in the Holy Bible, the message that has come forth from it. Lord, you do your will in our lives and make us know what you want from us. Help us to see, Lord, where you're at work and where we can join you and get in on the blessing that comes from being obedient servants. How we can become part of that great harvest you're trying to reap in the world around us. Thank you for loving us, for having the patience to put up with us. Lord, help us move daily closer to you and walk hand in hand with you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Folks, if you're out there today and you do not yet have Jesus in your life as your Savior, you're one of those poorly guided people wandering around lost, beaten down and defeated. You may feel like a champion. Because of this compassion, you're in your lost status. He'd like to have you stand up and say, I want Jesus.
Christ your name and the Lamb's book of life and save you for all eternity. Make that decision now where you're seated this morning and come and share that with us so we can rejoice in the victory that just came into your life. I like to talk to people about church membership. You may want to come and be able to pray a prayer of rededication of your life. You may have a special prayer request to share with you. I'll pray with you with that. You come and we sing this yellow decision. Your time to listen to the voice of God, the Holy Spirit, and then to do what He tells you to do. Let's stand.
our counter blessing ministry is up and running. If you know people who are not maybe battalions or struggling because of the economic situation here, they need food to eat, they need clothes to wear, we, we need you to tell them about the counter blessing ministry. You may even know Italians who are kind of beaten down by the current economic status there, the situation they're hurting. Tell them we have some stuff here to help them, and we'll, we'll greet them too. Okay, right now you're going to sing a song so you walk out of here with a smile on your face, a song in your heart. Go rejoicing. God bless you. Come to the next week, see if you can bring somebody to sit in that empty seat right there. Inside. You okay? Thank you.